So welcome, Elizabeth Thank McAllister. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, and hello, everyone. Um, and thank you to Sharon Kelly and the Berwick Public Library for hosting me this evening. In a few days, it's going to be Veterans Day. And so I'm especially excited and I'm honored to introduce you to some very special feathered veterans. It seems that dogs and horses who have served in the military have retained their beloved status. But pigeons somehow lost their luster and I am on a mission to change that. Uh, if nothing else, you're going to lead this presentation never to look at a pigeon in the same way again. So I wrote War Pigeons, Winged Couriers in the U.S. Military, 1878 to 1957, for a couple of reasons. One was to remind people to take a second look at the most extraordinary bird on the planet, and then, as I said earlier, to honor these birds as veterans. So homing pigeons are rock doves, the same sp species of pigeon that perches on rooftops and wanders around parks cleaning up after us. But they're a very special breed of rock dove. They're actually a combination of several breeds. And what resulted was uh, a super athlete, strong, fast, intelligent racing birds. And for three quarters of a century, they were the U.S. military's most reliable means of communication. Today, you're going to meet several of these birds. Here we go again. And one of them is pictured here on the slide. That's Peerless Pilot. He was one of the Navy's uh, most reliable couriers in World War I. At only 15 months of age, he flew um, 200 missions from planes like this one that were doing scouting runs looking for German uh, submarines and ships on the Atlantic Ocean uh, back to his loft in Pouillac, France. And Peerless Pilot represents the strength and endurance that homing pigeons uh, have. So for um, thousands of years, militaries have enlisted homing pigeons as couriers, and one of the earliest documented cases is of Julius Caesar using them to carry messages during his conquest of Gaul from 58 to 51 BC. That's more than 2,000 years ago. His pigeon handlers might have attached a message, as in this early engraving, either around a tail feather or maybe wrapped around a leg. So homing pigeons were especially helpful during sieges when a city was surrounded by the enemy and all communications cut. During the siege of Paris from 1870 to 71, pigeons floated out of the city in balloons to tour uh, about 130 miles away where there was a temporary government set up. And there they were outfitted with messages and uh, sent back into Paris. And by then, microphotography had just been uh, created, so they were able to reduce the text to tiny little bits, about an inch square, and they would roll them up, put them in a bird quill, and then tie that quill around a pigeon feather. And in this photograph, the pigeons are being carried in the green crates to the balloons. In this way, homing pigeons brought to Paris 150,000 official dispatches and about a million private messages. And you can imagine how the citizens of Paris felt. Um, they were uh, cut off from the rest of the world. They, had, uh, they were running out of fuel. They were running out of food. And when a homing pigeon came in, what it also brought was hope. And this uh, message of hope is repeated over and over and over again for the next 80 years or so. So the enormous and unexpected su success of pigeon couriers in the siege of Paris prompted many European militaries to include them in their ranks. They became all the rage. By the end of the 1880s, a spider web of pigeon messenger routes crisscross Europe. Every line you see here represents a pigeon route. And they even extended over water, which is important, from Spain to the Balearic Islands and from Italy to Sardinia. 
So, the success of pigeons in the militaries did not go unnoticed in this country, and both the Navy and the Army began to experiment with them. Henri Marion, a professor at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis and a pigeon expert standing here in the back row, believed that strongly that with homing pigeons, ships could communicate beyond the line of sight. Well, this was a phenomenon unheard of in our Navy because, of course, they were still communicating with horns and gun signaling and flags and flashing lights at night. So in 1891, he set out to convince the U.S. Navy to fund uh, a pigeon messenger service. With a few birds left over from an army loft, Professor Marion built a pigeon coat or house at the top of the academy's rigging loft in this tower shown here. And to demonstrate their ability to fly over water, which was hard to convince people in this country, even though they were doing it in Europe, he spearheaded a series of experiments, taking pigeons out to sea on academy vessels and then releasing them to fly back to their boathouse loft. After five years of successful trials, the Navy Department agreed in 1896 to fund six lofts on the east and west coast of this country. The locations chosen were at the Portsmouth Navy Shipyard just down the road from us, Newport, uh, Brooklyn, Norfolk, Key West, and Mare Island Navy bases, Mare Island near San Francisco. Now six were a far cry from the 20 Professor Marion had initially proposed, but it was a start. The lofts look similar to this one, which is the one at the Portsmouth Navy Yard. They were all the same size and painted red and white stripes, which the pigeons could easily see from the air. While the Navy lofts were being built and pigeons bought and trained, Professor Marion patented this message holder, the very first one to attach to a pigeon's leg. Here it is, and you can imagine how much more secure message would be than wrapped around a tail feather or around a leg. Per, and this became the prototype for the modern pigeon message holder. Professor Marion had no idea how important his design would become. Well, and then in 1901, an event occurred that changed how the world communicated Guillermo Marconi radioed three dots, Morse code for the letter S, across the Atlantic Ocean in a matter of seconds. By 1902, Navy ships were outfitted for wireless. The six pigeon coats closed or retrofitted for radio stations, and the birds sold off. And that was the end of the first official pigeon messenger service in this country. Henri Marion died in 1913, and while he never realized his dream of a fully feathered pigeon messenger service, he did live long enough to witness the beginning of the rise of pigeons into legend. For, in 1903, a new type of bird, one made of wood and cloth and powered by an engine, took to the air. Soon after, both the Army and Navy trained pilots to fly these planes, and it wasn't long before homing pigeons accompanied them. Pigeons were just getting started in their service to our country. Homing pigeons were especially valuable in World War I because the Signal Corps' communication technology wasn't very functional in trench warfare. Radios were crude and heavy, um, they had short ranges, they could be intercepted, and a telegraph and telephone wires were cut or trampled, and when signalmen crawled out of the trenches to fix them, they were shot down. The pitted, ruined terrain made travel harrowing for human and canine couriers, but homing pigeons got their messages through. About 600 birds were in the Signal Corps pigeon service, and this is a photo of a mobile loft uh, that stayed to the rear lines where the birds were raised and trained, and when the troops moved, the loft moved with them. 
Pigeons were carried from their lofts to the front in baskets on the backs of soldiers and marines, as in this photo, or on the backs of horses, mules, and dogs. <laughs> this little Airedale is crossing a stream with a basket of pigeons on its back. In this photo, soldiers in a trench have attached a message to a pigeon, and they are about to release it. Just think of it, weighing in at about uh, um, as much as a large apple. Pigeons flew through exploding shells, gunfire, gas, and smoke, hardly wavering even when mortally wounded. This is the war where pigeons became heroes. Uh, this is uh, Cherami. She, he is the most famous World War I homing pigeon. Uh, a number of books have been written about him and his heroic flight. What happened was a group of American soldiers fighting in the Argonne Forest in France were trapped behind German lines. They were pinned down on all sides by the Germans. Um, the human couriers uh, who tried to get the message through about where the location was just disappeared, never showed up again. And seven pigeons were released only to be shot down. After several days, hope for survival faded. Uh, half the battalion were dead or wounded. They were running out of food. And um, survival really faded when allies began to rain shells down on them. So Cherami was the last uh, pigeon, and the commander attached a message to uh, his right leg and let him go, and he flew 25 miles back to his loft in Rampant with his breast shattered and one leg missing. And the message was dangling by a, a tendon with the location of the battalion, and they were saved. Cherami was awarded uh, the, um, the Croix de Guerre, which is one of France's highest military honors, and General John Pers Pershing insisted that he ride in an officer's cabin on the ship on the way home to the United States. And of Cherami, Pershing said, uh, America cannot do enough for this bird. So last week, uh, I, I went to Washington, D.C., and um, I got to visit the man here is Dr. Frank Blazich. He's a military historian at the Smithsonian, and uh, I got to meet him. I had corresponded with him when I was doing research for the book, and in between us in the World War I display case is Cherami. And so I got to uh, meet this bird, though posthumously, and he uh, looks pretty good. He needs a little bit of cleaning up and work, but um, it was an honor to meet this very special veteran. So along with machine guns, tanks were a new formidable weapon in World War I, but its noisy cumbersome crawl didn't affect pigeons that went along as crew. And here a tanker on the western front is releasing an allied bird out a small window at the side of the tank. While the Army and the Marines fought the war on land, the U.S. Navy flew scouting missions from bases on the coasts of England, France, and Italy. With very little training and only a compass to guide them, Navy pilots like Erlen H. Parker from Farmington, Maine, flew rickety biplanes over the ocean looking for German submarines and ships. No pilot left without a couple of homing pigeons, which were sent back for help should a plane ditch. Hundreds of down airmen were saved by these remarkable couriers. Parker spoke of another use of his birds when fog was encountered. He said that out of sight of land, um, the only thing that they could do was release their pigeons. Now, he said you couldn't follow the pigeons, but you could see them shoot up, circle to find their bearings, and you could see them s head straight for land. And he said that's all we needed to know where land was. So you've already met Peerless Pilot, and this is Skipper, uh, another Navy uh, courier. And he, um, you can see how strong he looks. It looks a little different than maybe a pigeon in the park. 
And uh, Skipper operated out of Brest, France, and this is his loft. And Skipper once uh, delivered a message from 400 miles out at sea. This was an astounding feat, really. Uh, it's about 400 miles from here to Baltimore. And you can imagine flying that and a little bird this big over water with no place to stop and rest. I don't want to leave World War I without mentioning Kaiser. He was a German pigeon captured by American forces in 1918 toward the end of the war. He was a big handsome bird. You can see the size of his feet there. And he was brought back to the United States along with 21 other feathered POWs. He was installed at the Signal Corps uh, Pigeon Center at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. He was issued comfortable quarters and a mate and encouraged to breed more war pigeons. By the 1930s, Kaiser was the last surviving captured German pigeon in American custody, and despite his age, his offspring proved to be champion racers, and some flew uh, for the Allies in World War II. And Kaiser uh, traveled um, down to Washington for President Wilson's inauguration in 1949, and uh, on Halloween night, he passed away at Fort Monmouth at the ripe old age of 32. That's ancient for a pigeon. And um, he outlived his namesake and several wives. And I, I, and I got a special treat at the museum I hadn't expected. But here he is. Poor old Kaiser doesn't look quite as lively <laughs> as, as the first photo. Again, he needs to be cleaned up. Um, all pigeons have this wattle on their beak, and Kaiser, uh, Kaiser has a rather large one, and because he's old, and the older you are, the bigger your wattle is. And what's interesting is this is his band from Germany that identified him as a German pigeon, but he has a second band on the other leg, and that was given to him uh, by a legion post uh, out in Los Angeles because they wanted to uh, recognize him as having served in two wars. And so he also got a special ban from the, from the American Legion. So pigeons were so successful as couriers in World War I that after the war, both the Army and Navy established breeding and training centers for birds and pigeoneers, their handlers. The Army established theirs at the center at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, and the Navy at Naval Air Station Anacostia, D.C. And this is Chief Quartermaster Henry Quebec in charge of training pigeons and pigeoneers at Anacostia. On this day, He's releasing birds from the Potomac River to fly back to their base. Pigeons were also released from planes as part of their training, and a pilot had to be extremely careful about how and when a bird was let go, lest it be sucked into a wing or a fuselage by the wind. Back at their loft at a training run, the pigeons received royal treatment. Other than a duck, no bird likes a bath more than a pigeon. And here they are enjoying one uh, outside their loft. Their loft inside uh, was spectacular. It had electricity and running water, and at night armed guards patrolled the grounds. A special hospital took care of any avian concerns. Only the most cosseted racehorses received care equal to that of the Anacostia homing pigeons. In the 1920s and 30s, military pigeons also flew for other government agencies such as the U.S. Forest Service, U.S. Geological Survey, and the Civilian Conservation Corps. They kept them aloft and they also entered them in a lot of uh, um, different kinds of races. So, not 30 years after the war to end all wars, Homing pigeons were called up again to serve our country in the Second World War. Despite huge advance, advances in radio technology, such as uh, longer ranges and walkie-talkies, homing pigeons were called upon, were lied upon for backup or when radio silence was enforced. Here in this country, we trained about 54,000 at various um, posts around, and about 36,000 were deployed overseas. 
World War II was fought on four continents, including this one, and homing pigeons flew for the army on every front. They carried messages across deserts, over snowy mountaintops, through jungles, and over large expanses of ocean. And in this slide, pigeons are exercised from a mobile loft in snowy Fuda Pass, Italy. Uh, in this photo, a mobile loft, also in Italy, has been dug into the ground and camouflaged. Maybe the enemy couldn't spot the loft, but the pigeons never missed it. So this is a photograph of uh, the actual message carried by Gustav, a British pigeon that operated in the D-Day landings June 6, 1944. Gustav was taken across the channel to France on a landing ship, and he was released by news correspondent Montague Taylor. He, he, Gustav traveled 150 miles back to his loft in 5 hours 16 minutes in a 30 mile per hour headwind. Um, by this time, of course, um, radio, uh, you know, you could radio uh, back and forth ac across the channel, but due to radio silence, uh, a mere pigeon uh, brought the first word of the landing back to England. And it says, we are just 20 miles or so off the beaches. First assault troops landed 0750. Signal says to no interference from enemy gunfire on beach. Passage uneventful. Uh, steaming steadily. Information, lightnings, typhoons, and fortresses, which were planes crossing since 0545. No enemy aircraft seen. And at the bottom, you can see... Um, the time that Gustav was liberated and uh, Montague Taylor's signature and back at the RAF loft, that was the time that they received the message. Um, and this is a typical pigeon form. Most of them looked something like that. Well, Gustav uh, had, had done such a, uh, an important mission that he received the Dickin Medal, Britain's equivalent of the Victoria Cross for Animals. And he's also receiving a kiss, and I don't know who that's from, but um, she must have been a dignitary of some sort. In World War II, pigeons parachuted out of planes for the first time, sometimes by themselves floating to, to the ground in a little crate, or with a paratrooper, as shown here. You can see the pigeon resting safely in a specially made vest that's strapped onto the soldier's chest. Well, this type of vest was developed by Ida Rosenthal. She was the founder of Maiden Form Brasiers. Designing soft, close-fitting vests would have been a pretty easy assignment for Ida. This is Blackie Halligan. I'd like you to meet him. He is the only military pigeon to receive a Purple Heart. Blackie served in Guadalcanal in World War II, and one day he flew an important message to his home loft about the location of 300 Japanese troops. But he was late. He was very late because he'd been shot down by Japanese guns. He managed to uh, get himself aloft and he got his message through uh, despite being very badly wounded. General Alex Alexander Patch made a special trip to his loft to award him the medal. Only two other animals have ever been awarded the Purple Heart. One was Stubby, a dog who served in World War I, and the other was uh, a mare, a horse, reckless, um, Sergeant Reckless, who served with Marines in Korea. In World War II, waves began to train homing pigeons at naval air stations in the U.S. so that male pigeoneers could deploy. And in this photo, a wave at a base in Santa Ana, California, is inspecting the feathers of a potential warbird. And here, um, a couple of waves are, uh, are getting to know their birds. <laughs> While the Navy rarely used pigeons on planes or ships in World War II, they included them in crews of airships and free balloons that flew off both coasts of this country um, hunting for enemy ships and submarines. And here, a pigeon is being released from a blimp on a training run. 
Again, great care had to be taken to ensure the bird flew safely away from the vessel. Launching the pigeons, while a lot was no easy feat, said a blimp pilot uh, at Moffett Field, California, to clear the prop wash of the blimp, a crewman held the bird's wings down and then threw the critter from a cabin window much in the same manner as a football. During World War II, every state had a civil defense council that remained uh, prepared in the event of attack on the home front. Pigeon racing clubs all over the country had already donated thousands of birds to be trained and deployed overseas, but they also gave them to um, de defense units to be used as part of their communications plans in the event other means were broken or sabotaged. Here, a member of the Lansing, M Michigan Civil Defense Council is releasing a pigeon as part of a drill. This photo, also from the Lansing Civil Defense Council, shows how a modern message capsule, after Professor Marion's design, uh, attaches to a pigeon's leg. So the last bird I would like uh, you to meet is G.I. Joe. He's one of America's most famous war pigeons. In World War II, he flew for the Allies in Italy. An air attack had been planned to subdue German presence in the village of Kovivecchia, but the 56th London Infantry had, al had advanced quickly and already secured the village. So, with the air attack about to commence, the infantry and the civilians were in danger of being bombarded by friendly fire. G.I. Joe was hurriedly released with a message to call off the attack. He flew the 20 miles back to his home loft in 20 minutes, and he reached Allies' lines just as the bombers were revving their engines. His swift flight saved the lives of at least 100 Allied soldiers and many civilians. In, uh, and for this, uh, he received the Dickin Medal. He got home, uh, went to Fort Monmouth, and he retired. And then in 1946, he flew uh, to London, where he was aw awarded the Dickin Medal. So between 1943 and 1949, the Dickin Medal was awarded to 52 animals. 36 of those animals were homing pigeons. But G.I. Joe uh, was the only American pigeon to ever receive that medal. So, in 1955, a young pigeoneer named Tommy DeRosa was stationed at Fort Monmouth, and he cared for G.I. Joe. In this photo, he's holding the famous bird in front of the Churchill Loft, which was the loft designated for the heroes. In 1957, the pigeon program at Fort Monmouth was closed, and most of the birds sold off at auction. And uh, writing later on in the Army Communicator magazine, Major Ron Frayne described the event. Fort Monmouth looked like a Rolling Stones concert, he said. Pigeon lovers and breeders started to arrive at 2 a.m. to purchase the 1,018 birds that were to be sold at $5 a pair. A person was allowed to buy five pairs, and by 11 a.m. that morning, they had all been bought, and hundreds of pigeon fanciers went home without so much as a feather. Um, the heroes went to different zoos around the country, and G.I. Joe and his mate went to the Detroit Zoo, where he lived till he was 18 years old. But G.I. Joe's story didn't end at the Detroit Zoo. On November 15th in 2019, at the Rayburn House on Capitol Hill, the newly established animals in War and Peace Bravery Medals were presented to honor American war animals. Two living dogs received medals, while three more dogs, two pigeons, and one horse received them posthumously. 64 years after serving at Fort Monmouth, Tommy DeRosa was there to receive the medal for G.I. Joe, and here he is standing next to the mounted G.I. Joe with the medal. So I'm going to end there. Um, if you're interested in buying my book, you can do so via the publisher or your local bookstore or Amazon. And I've also uh, left a copy of the book here at your library. Um, 
I included some websites. The American Racing Pigeon Union is the overseeing uh, organization for racing clubs in this country. Uh, there really is uh, a museum solely dedicated to pigeons. There really is. And it's in Oklahoma City, the American Pigeon Museum. And then the last um, website I'm particularly excited to tell you about because um, a bill is, uh, this is for the National Service Animals Monument. And a bill is making its way through Congress right now, uh, as we speak here, to pass legislation to honor and recognize the contributions that service animals and their handlers have made to the security and independence of our country throughout history. Finally, including homing pigeons, so many other countries have erected monuments uh, just to honor the pigeons who served in their militaries, and this country never did. Not one plaque, nothing. So they are finally going to include homing pigeons in this monument, which is going to be sort of a sculpture garden, and it's going to be somewhere in the uh, Washington, D.C. environs. Um, I'd be happy to answer um, any questions, and I, I, I hope you'll agree that you're not going to look at a pigeon in the same way again. Thank you. <laughs> no questions? Yes? Uh, how does this all work with these pigeons? And how do they get impressed to come to a specific point? Like if you're training them in New Jersey and then you take them overseas to Italy. Oh, uh, you know, uh, how do they, how, 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 what ensures that they're not flying back to Monmouth? Right. Jersey? Well, they, they res resettle them uh, over in, in uh, say, they, they go to, uh, to Italy, to um, a lot there. So they wouldn't send out the adult birds that, that, w that went over there. They would probably raise young. Um, if they did send out uh, adult birds, they would have to, uh, that is a danger, they would have to um, make sure that they stayed in their loft a long enough time. So what makes them want to stay in their loft? They love their nest and they love their mate. They mate for life and uh, uh, they just, that's the only place that any of them want to be. And food, Lofts are clean, they're airy, they, they just want to be home. So they would have to spend quite a lot of time settling an adult bird, but I, I believe they probably mostly use birds that were shipped over there to raise, and so you would settle a, a young bird right from that mobile loft. It's a good question, yeah. Yes. I'm just interested in your professional background. What what got you to the I point know, to go I know. Uh, so I like birds, but yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'm not an ornithologist. But um, uh, m my parents were sort of um, casual bird watchers, and my father loved barnyard birds, and we had those around. Um, I was doing research for another book on uh, women spies, a young adult book that I wrote with another author, and I just came across. Um, an article about pigeons around World War I or just previous that carried cameras on their chests and they would um, uh, release them with these little cameras and then they would automatically snap photos of the terrain underneath and then they would uh, develop those photos so they were sort of spying and I just thought that was amazing. So this is many years ago, 10 years ago, and I just started to read more and more and more about them. And I saw that there wasn't really a book that, um, that chronicled the, the um, service uh, of these pigeons to our, our military. So I, I thought I'd better, I'd better do it. You did a great job. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's been really a wonderful journey. It really has. I, I didn't know any more about them other than they, you know, tootled around parks. You must have really wanted to get home after you finished this book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like the birds themselves. <laughs> Big job, right? Yeah, wow. Thank you. Do people still race for Oh, yes. Yes. Oh yes, I've I've had um, several people come to my talks here in Maine who 
who, who have lofts. And um, during the spring and early fall, when it's lighter out at this time of day, I have a friend, his name is John Bernhard, and he lives in Westbrook, and he has a small loft. And when he can get away, which isn't all the time, he brings his birds to my talks, and then he'll do um, a release uh, for, for, for the audience. It's especially fun when there, there are children there. They, they really, really enjoy it. He lets the children release the bird. Yeah. So um, when he can come, I, I try to include him, but he, he hasn't been able to very much this fall. But yeah, there's a, oh, a couple of clubs. There's a club in um, Lewiston, I believe, and there was one in, uh, in Biddeford. They're around. Yeah, they're around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is G.I. Joe at the Smithsonian too? You know, I, I forgot to ask Frank that, the historian. I don't think he is. No, he's at, um, I think, the Pentagon, I think. Or, or the Army. The, uh, the Army has him. Yeah, the Army has him. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And that award that he got, that goes on every year. So 2020, it didn't happen because of COVID. But it did happen last year. I think a couple of dogs were awarded it. And it is going to happen this month later on. And Frank said um, a, another famous World War II pigeon named Mocker, he's going to receive the uh, award posthumously, along with some other, maybe some more dogs. So yeah, it, it, it happens every year. I tried to get an invitation to it, especially to see G.I. Joe. I wrote my congresswoman, Shelley P. I, you know, tried every which way to get an invitation, and I, I was not, I couldn't go. I know, I was really disappointed. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, I was very, very dis disappointed that I, I wasn't able to go because I would have liked to have seen Tommy there. And I was able to meet Tommy once um, when I was doing my research. Unfortunately, he died last January of, of COVID. Aww. Yeah, it, it's really sad, but um, it, I, I was very honored and it was a very um, special uh, time to be able to meet him. It always makes when you're researching a book, you know, the best part of research is when you can actually talk to a person who's involved in your topic. And uh, I was just thrilled to meet this person, Frank, down at, at the Smithsonian. It just makes everything more alive and more real. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, um, meeting an, some unsung ve veterans. And maybe if you see some pigeons flying this Veterans Day, you'll, you'll remember them. Too. Excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.